Recording in progress. Yes. If you look at our timetable, uh, you remember that under we talk about understanding the concept of risk. So under the measure of association, you want to understand because what you are looking at is odds ratio and relative risk. And you must be able to understand this concept of risk. Well, you can relative risk can make meaning to you, odds ratio can make meaning to you. You must understand the concept of risk and the concept of odds. What do they mean? They will now go on to odds ratio and relative risk, and we also run it with experts and are now talk about interpreting it with their confidence in Taba. And you are going to know later that uh, if you want to publish uh, in a high impact journal like Lancet. Nobody take p-value from you. Nobody. They prefer you using confidence interval. If it is you are dealing with uh, uh, quantitative variable, like you are talking of mean, you want to know the difference between mean and the confidence interval. If it is uh, proportion like this, you want to know odd ratio and confidence interval, or relative risk and confidence interval. So we we'll quickly look at them. Uh, <clears throat> so, Let's quickly look at this concept of risk. Now, risk is probability. So when we talk about risk, it means probability. So many people think, you know, the day-to-day -day usage of risk, they look at it as something, the probability of something bad happening. So in probability, they say it's not like that. It's just probability. It can be probability of anything good, anything bad, whatever. Risk is probability. But uh, you know, in everyday usage also, uh, sometimes they say this is probability that something will work not according to plan. Uh, some in the everyday usage also, they say they talk about speculative risk, where both bad and good can happen. People that get involved in portfolio investment, they know that, uh, or even people that gamble, they, they know that uh, if you put your money, you either gain or lose. That's just it. So that's it. They know the risk is speculative. You know, there's a risk you, you, you win that part. There's a risk you lose out completely. So that is, but the risk itself is, the meaning of risk is probability. Risk means probability. I'll call you later, I'll come and see me, I'm in a lecture. So risk is probability that a particular event or outcome will happen over time. So the probability that event will happen over time. So you just know that risk is probability. But one thing you will now know is that uh, this art we are talking of is closely related to risk. Halt is risk over one minus risk. That is, if risk is probability, halt is probability over one minus probability. I know that uh, Probability, one minus probability or one minus risk is the probability that event will not happen. So if you say the probability is you rain today, the probability that it's rain today is 0 0.6. The probability or it will rain tomorrow is 0 0.6. The probability that it will not rain tomorrow is one minus 0 0.6, which is 0 0.4. So the so the the probability, the opposite, the complement that the event will not happen is one minus that the probability that event will happen. So this one you talk about us now is risk over one minus three, that is probability over one minus probability, which means probability that the event will happen over probability that the event will not happen. That is the hot. So if you know what if you if you know probability that the event will happen, you can know the hot by putting the probability that it will happen over the probability that it will not happen. That will be the heart. You will get to know something. Okay, let me give an example. Uh, if somebody said the probability that it will rain tomorrow is 0 0.6, what is the probability that, and what is the odds that it will rain tomorrow? I want somebody to, you know, it's a workshop. I want you to you know, let's discuss it. That's why, and I don't want the people that we that are here yesterday. Let's uh, either Dr. Morigui or Dr. Ati discuss it. That is, if I say the probability that it will rain, which is the risk that it will rain tomorrow, is 0 0.6. What is the odds that it will rain tomorrow? From what the explanation I've given about, about 
hurt and risk. You can see it on the screen, the relationship between hurt and risk. The odds that you're going tomorrow is uh, the limit you gave us, the probability 0 0.6 all over minus um, um, 0 0.6, which is yes. 0.4. Exactly. So 0.6 over 0.4 is the odds. Yeah. It now give you, if you now calculate it to give you 6 over 4, which is 3 over 2, which is 1.5, right? Yes, I want it. Yeah, it will be 1.5. So you will know from there that you look at the table by the right. You know, you, we all know that probability ranges from 0 to 1. So risk ranges from 0 to 1. It cannot be less than 1. It cannot be greater than 0. So it's in between 0 and 1, inclusive, the possibility. Now, you, from what you have calculated now, the whole you calculate which of 1.5. It should give you a clue that part is not like that. Us also will range from a zero to infinity. So you should know that the heart is greater, can be greater than one, but the risk cannot be greater than one. Because risk is probability, cannot be greater than one, cannot be less than zero. The odds can be, cannot be less than zero, so they can be greater than one. Now, if you do change of subject or formula, you will see that uh, risk also is odd over one plus odd. Now, I want us to look at this table, go back to look at the table. Now you will see that when uh, probability is zero, they calculated risk or probability for some event. And now calculated the corresponding odds. You will see that if uh, risk uh, or probability is zero, the hold is zero. If probability is this, we will see something. Okay, I want to ask again, uh, Dr. Morigbe and Dr. Uh, Dr. Ache. If the probability you calculated, if the probability that you will tomorrow is 0 0.5, what is the odds? What would be the odds? If the probability that you will tomorrow is 0 0.5, what is the odds that you will rain tomorrow? To be 1 minus 0.5. Eh? 1 minus 0 0.5. And that would be 0 0.5. Now, I say, what is the, if the probability that it will rain tomorrow, is 0 0.5. What is the hot? Okay. Rain, what is the hot that it will rain tomorrow? To be one. It will be one because uh, yes. it's going to be one over one minus one. And one minus one will be zero. In, in, no, sorry, it's going to be uh, all over one. It's going to be 0 0.5 over one minus 0 0.5. It will be 0 0.5 over 0 0.5. It will be one. Nice. Then, if the probability that it will rain tomorrow is one, the hold will be infinity because it's going to be one over one minus one. One minus one will be zero. One over anything over zero will be infinity. So you look at this table now. When the probability moves to from zero to halfway, halfway because the highest will be one. If it moves from zero halfway, that is through zero point five, the hold has reached one. So the hold has doubled its own journey from zero to one. That's double what probability has done. But when the probability that move from 0 0.5 to the other one, the whole will move from that one to infinity. Can you see now? That's the relationship between odd and risk. Now, if you look at the diagram below, you know, when you are calculating probabilities, like when you say proportion, look at this uh, circle now, something like pie, uh, pie chart. You see this red area is the sector that you are looking at probability. So probability will be that sector over the total, both the, the unshaded area and shaded area in the denominator. Just like as we are here now, you know, so what is the, if we have 10, uh, 10 people, you say out of 10, three are female. What is the proportion of female? You say you remove those three female, three over 10, you will not say three over seven, you say three over 10. But that 10, three also is three part of the 10. That is part of a whole. That is probability, that is proportion for you, probability. So, but uh, if it is odd, when you remove that sector, you are dividing it by the complement. What make it, no, what make it to complete 100%? So that is why, you see, odd is probability, which is the red one, over one minus probability. 
The probability is the red part. The one minus probability is the sector minus that one. So can you see that? And one thing is that uh, if you look at it, when the disease is there, when that particular attribute is very rare, what that sector is small, one all over that it will, be, it will be close to approximate probability. That ought will approximate probability. And that is why you see as the probability is going to zero, odd is close to zero. Look at alpha zero is 0 0.001 now. Probability, odd is 0 0.001001. So if you look at it, as the risk probability is small, the corresponding odd is small. As it becoming smaller and smaller, the corresponding odd becoming like probability. Until when you get to zero, both of them are zero. So it's at zero that both of them are the same. But as the probability is becoming bigger and bigger, the hole becoming bigger and bigger and bigger. Any question on this slide before we move forward? The concept of God and risk. Please ask question. No question? Okay. Uh, sir, sir. Go on. Sir, this is uh, the word risk and God. The, the risk means probability, and what you have taught us just now. Yes. And if the, the probability of rain falling tomorrow is 0 0.5. Okay. And you're not asking, what is the odd of the rain falling tomorrow? Is it an, is it an opposite thing? It's not opposite. What is the, is, is by dividing the real thing by the opposite. So the odd of the rain falling tomorrow is the probability that the rain falls tomorrow over the probability that the rain will not fall tomorrow. You know, the rain from tomorrow is P. The probability that the rain will not fall tomorrow is one minus P. Mm -hmm. You know something? You know, if they say the probability, uh, just like a male and female, they are complementary. If they say, oh, the, prob the proportion of female among us is 30%, you know, you'll be asking for the male. That shows that the remaining 70% is male. You get a vision now. So it's the complement. So because it takes. Uh, if we say we are total in the whole now, it takes addition of the male and female to make all the total. If you remove female, it remain male, or remove male, it remain female. It's the same thing. If the probability the total package is one. If the probability is 0 0.5, the probability that it will not happen is the remaining 0 0.5. If the probability that event occurs is 0 0.3, the probability that event will not occur is 0 0.7. If the probability that event will occur is 0 0.2, the probability that event will not occur is 0 0.8. Do you get it now? But the hold now, what it does is to now put that probability over the one minus that the at least the probability that event occur over the probability that the event does not or will not occur. That is the hold. Does it make sense? Yes. Now, the people that do speculation, the all those who are bet for football, who will win? They don't use probability, they use odd. The reason is very simple. It gives you, if you are trying to uh, calculate with all your data available about what a particular team has played, and this one, all this scenario, you are putting it together. If you calculate the probability for two uh, teams or three teams, you want to know which one will likely win. Because the probability are very close in value, because it's a close something, it's zero to one. So you see that the, the, when you calculate for different categories, different team. You may see that they will, you won't see much change. But if you convert it to all, be able to see the one that is outrageous, as bigger, you'll be able to know that nah, this one has got. So they you'll be able to know which one will likely mean you will win. If you convert the probability to all, it gives you the distance between different values, very big. You'll be able to know which one is ah, this one is far, far bigger. You'll be able to see this one will likely win. So the people that speculate the bet, they don't use probability, they use odds. Does it make sense? Yes. Okay, we'll proceed. Sense. Yeah. Now, relative risk now, when we say relative risk, is the same thing as, call, as risk ratio. It's very simple. What you just do is that a relative risk, it show you, it give impression that you are comparing two risks, one risk relative to the other. So you calculated two risks, you are comparing them. And now do you compare the two risks? You divide one by the other. That is where the ratio comes in. No ratio is whatever you get when you divide two quantity of the same unit. I actually give the example. <clears throat> and now I actually give. 
And if somebody travel 100 kilometer, 400 kilometer in four hours. When you say, what is the speed you play? 100 kilometer over four, it give you four hours, it give you 100 kilometer per hour. That is the speed. But the speed is not a ratio in the sense that when you, the numerator is kilometer, the denominator is R. So the unit is kilometer per hour. But if somebody travel 400 kilometer, another person travel four kilometers, and now divide 400 by four, it give you 100. It's not 100 kilometer, it's just 100 because kilometer has canceled kilometer. You get it now? So whatever you get, it's just 100. It's a ratio. Whatever number that does not carry unit, it's a ratio. Now, you that was there are many of them. All these this uh, this call and correlation, they are all ratio, they are dimensionless because you are divided two things of similar unit, and that is why it has no unit. So when you calculate risk two risk, they are similar in many sense. For example, now you look at okay, some people are smoke, so smoking cigarettes. You want to calculate okay, how many out of these uh, 100 people people that are smoking cigarettes, how many of them end up developing lung cancer? When you calculate, maybe out of it, maybe about uh, five out of the 100 develop lung cancer. And that's the oh, five percent. That is the, the you know, five percent. That is uh, people, the, 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 the risk which is 0 0.05, the risk of developing lung cancer among smokers. You know, I have another set of people that are not smokers. You know, say out of 100, there's only one person that developed lung cancer. The risk you know, is 0 0.01. Yes, I'm not. Now, the relative, you have calculated two risks. You want to now compare, you want to see, it's like, when we are looking at it, the people that are smoking, it's like the more of them develop lung cancer than the people that is small. But how do you know how many times is it more? How big is it more? You now try to divide the risk among the smoker by the risk among the small, small, not smokers. That is the relative risk. Relative. I think the risk among the people are relative to the risk among the non smoker. Or another way, it's a ratio because you are dividing. That's why you can call it risk ratio or the relative risk. It's the same thing. So when you divide the 0 0.05, which is the risk among the smoker, by the 0 0.01, which is the risk among the non-smoker, you get five. What is telling you is that uh, the people that debate that smoke are five times more likely, five times more likely to develop lung cancer than the people that don't smoke. Can you see that is the logic? Now, that is the way they compare the two risks. The heart ratio is similar. The only thing is that uh, the old you can in the whole ratio, as you have said, you have seen, you cannot you cannot calculate odds unless the event has happened. If you look at it, we calculate even the whole from the risk. The risk, the risk probability is futuristic. If somebody, something has happened, we cannot say what is the probability that the thing will happen. Somebody dies, say what is the probability that the man will die. He has already died. So the issue there is that you least probability is about something that has not happened. What is the, how, the likelihood of it happening? But the heart is you can only you can calculate it even when the thing has happened, when the thing has not happened, whichever way. It doesn't have to be futuristic. It's, it's so risk is super futuristic. Why the heart, it, of course, you get it from the risk. So you don't have to the thing is possible the thing has happened. It's possible the thing has not happened, you can calculate the heart. So that is why the whole now, as you've already gotten it, is you calculate the probability that the event has happened over the probability that it does not happen. That is the heart of the event happening. So odd, so the same thing, odd ratio, when you calculate the heart for one, for the issue of long cancer or whatever, we calculate one for one group, we calculate the heart for another, for another group, you can see the value of the heart, but you want to compare the two odds. You now divide one by the other. When you divide one by the other, that is odds ratio, you no, know, or relative odds, odds of one group relative to the other. So it's only that relative risk stick to relative risk, odd ratio stick to odd ratio. So it can be the other way. Relative risk can be called this ratio also. Relative odds 
uh, odd ratio can also be called relative odds. The only thing that relative odd ratio and the odd itself, they are odd ratio used in a situation where you cannot, the disease has happened, the event has happened, you cannot be calculating the risk, so you are comparing risk. So if there are some research setting that like that. So there are some research studies that you can you are still futuristic. When you hear prospective study, the study that you are doing something you are looking for, like cohort study, like an experimental study, prospective, like experimental study now. You carry you measure your attribute, you want to measure, you intervene, you do something with the hope that after a while, that thing you do you influence what you want to measure, you go back to measure. In as much that you are looking for for something happening, that's why you are measuring again. Is 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 prospective, so you can calculate the risk. You can calculate the risk that this thing happen, and you have already said the risk doesn't have to be something bad. It may be something good. The risk that the person is ill after he has you administer a particular treatment is risk. So you can calculate. So you can calculate risk for a study like cohort study, where you gather people that have not developed disease, like a people that are smoker. They call them cohort. What is the word borrowed from Roman uh, military, Roman army in those days? A court is a group of people that were that, enjoyed, that joined the army at the same time. And everything they do together, they get their promotion together, everything. No people that join army at the same time. You would like to you know some of even they do even at the same year, but uh, around the same time, because they be going together, they are cohort. So cohort just means some group of people that you capture at a particular point in time that are they are exposed to a certain factor. So like cigarette smoking, now, they are caught, you can gather them. Then you now get the control. You will now want to see in the future, among this cohort I have gathered, how many of them will develop lung cancer? Among the control that are not smoking, how many of them will develop lung cancer? Because in that type of study, you can look forward, you know, to see event happening. So the same thing, that cohort and experimental design, they have that in common. They come to something like case control study, come to something like a uh, cross-sectional study, where you just go there. In cross-sectional study, you, you go there, you measure obesity hypertension, you measure body blood pressure, you measure the BMI, you everything at the same time as you go. And you now run your analysis, and I say, oh, it's like, ah, most of those people that are obese, they are hypertensive. Oh, obesity is a contributor to hypertension. Who told you? Because it, 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 you, you won't be able to establish for each of them that their obesity started before the hypertension. Even for some of them, they were even hypertensive before they, they became obese. So you see, in a cross-sectional study, you cannot establish that temporal sequence. Temporal sequence means that the exposure occur before the outcome, before the disease. So if somebody you you have not been drinking, you are not you are not smoking, you develop something later. You are not so say this cigarette and so, so you are not saying, forget about that. You have not smoked before in your life. It's not that you are smoking. When you see that, so in that situation, you cannot say that it's the cigarette that causes your this. Now, if you really never smoke and you have uh, a problem, then you are not smoking again. That is because of that smoke. So there must be that temporal sequence. But in, in, in cross-sectional study, you cannot establish it. So what really happens is that whatever you are mentioning there, it has happened. Either obesity or hypertension, the person has already gotten it. That's why you are, you are telling us. So in that situation, the event has occurred. So you cannot calculate any risk for anything. The same thing with uh, case control. Case control, <clears throat> you have the people that have the disease. You now want to ask questions about, oh, was he exposed? That is all. So if you look at it now, you cannot so if disease has occurred, you cannot say you are calculating this. So in that case, you calculate thought and calculate odd ratio. So you can see the situation situation where you can but mind you, there is no place where you can really use odd ratio that you cannot use where you can use relative risk that you cannot use odd ratio. Even in the experimental design. In course, you can see calculate your odd ratio, but it's not you cannot calculate relative risk in case control. You cannot calculate relative risk in a, in a cross sectional study, but where you can calculate risk, you can also calculate odd. So we don't see that odd ratio is more universal because uh, look at the uh, irrespective of the study, that was study you are doing, all this software like. Uh, uh, starter, uh, 
uh, think of either a PINFO or, or SBSS, when you run logistic recreation, it, it's odd ratio. Forget whether the data you are dealing with is uh, experimental or whatever. It's odd ratio. Odd ratio is universal. It, let me give you an example. It's just like an HOD and a lecturer, a, a junior lecturer, an HOD. You see, you, you cannot, if you, you as a junior lecturer or junior consultant, you are not going to be in your clinic, you don't say HOD, cover for me, it's not possible. So relative risk is the real thing, it's like the HOD. The uh, lecturer, the junior lecturer is really, is, uh, is the odd ratio. You get it now. So the better, if the, if the, the HOD is not around, you can act. Say that anything direct to Dr. So and so, you can act. You can act as HOD around that time because you are standing in for the HOD. So hard ratio can still start, it's, it's a proxy to risk. Since we cannot calculate risk, we now use odds. So odd ratio can represent relative risk. The relative risk you cannot represent odd ratio. No, relative risk is elite, so it doesn't even need to represent the odd ratio. But uh, the issue there is that uh, relative risk more money in the university. There's no study where you cannot use relative risk. This one, many people don't know. Many people go and see people uh, in exam because of a uh, out of the situation uh, of terminology part two. Somebody did a uh, cross sectional study, he did a ratio uh, examiner that uh, he didn't even allow exam again. So he said, no, 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 no. It's not a case control study. No, it cannot calculate a ratio. He failed the person. So can you see that it's better not to be informed than to be half informed? That the uh, examiner is half informed was half informed. So, and, uh, and they were flexing muscle, destroying people's life. And uh, people will go for exam after spending so much. Even some people who had accident and died, you know, we leave, some will leave my degree to Lagos or where, far distance. And the uh, people will, yeah, if the first thing fail because the gene is not good enough, okay, you go and try again to, to, be, to be good at it. But know that somebody do the right thing because of the ignorance of the teacher or the who is the examiner, and pay the person. It's very pathetic. So now, odd ratio is used when occurrence of an event is very rare. It exists, it's very rare. You know, when you cannot calculate the risk, you know, when you cannot calculate the risk, then when it is very, most of the time, most, like for example, now, a rare disease, if you go and use your conduct cohort study to study a rare disease, you can follow up for 40 years, you may not see one case, or you see cases few, it may not be enough for your analysis. If the disease is there, you gather those who that you think are exposed to the factor responsible for the disease, you may not develop it. You may not see anything, and you will have wasted money because core study is the most expensive study, more expensive than uh, experimental study because of this follow up for a long period of time, it requires money for follow up for a long period of time. So if the intelligent people say, wait, if this is the way we're wasting our time, if you can find any case, you look for those cases. In most of the time, in fact, it will be multi-center study. You may see one case in uh, Loni, two cases in Ibado, uh, three in Lagos, one in Benin, one in Portaco. You know, you may see scatter, scatter, scatter like that all over the country. Even sometimes over the country, continent, you call it multi-center study, where you, because the team is very few, you now, since you gather all those few cases, you now gather control. Control are people that are similar in all the demographics, except that particular disease. So you now begin to ask questions, to go back and say, okay, did you ask about the factor you think is responsible for the disease? That is case control study. So of course, you know that the disease has occurred. Depends on, so what you can calculate is odd. So it's odd ratio. It's how you can calculate and compare between two groups. That's why you use odd ratio. So case control study, cross-sectional analytical study. So you use odd ratio. Most statistical methods such as logic C regression that are employed to identify the predictors of outcome and also remove confounders use odd ratio to measure the strength of association. So you see odd ratio, I said I, it's more, somehow more universal. Now, can, let's quickly conceptualize. 
some of the things I just said about this poor study, whatever, because we make you to understand the usage of this relative risk and then uh, all ratio. Risk can only be calculated when you capture the event that has not occurred. You know, the beginning of your study, the event has not occurred. That's the only way you can calculate the risk. If you know of your study, the event has occurred, you cannot calculate risk. So now you see that line where they are hanging. That line is what draw looking backward, separate looking backward from looking forward. So you look backward when the disease has already occurred. You are just looking backward to know what caused the disease. You look for when the disease has not occurred, but you have seen the factors. You now follow up the factors. Factors for how, how many of them we develop the disease. So this way now, the disease has occurred here. You are looking backward to see what is the cause of the just like somebody that fall. Where you say. Uh, if you had a liver for, you will look back. If it's a small child, you will look forward. The liver, we say that must be because if he fall forward, he knows that what cause is fall is at the back, he will look back. But if it is a small child, he will look forward. He doesn't want to, he just wants to just be going. Now, in the same thing here, so the core study, you look forward because. Is the factor you are looking at. The disease has not occurred. The factor you are looking at. So you start with the factor, you want to see in future the disease will occur. So in that situation, you can calculate risk. You can calculate relative risk. But in the situation where the disease has occurred, you look backward. What is the cause of the disease? Are you seeing that? So in the case control study now, you start with the disease, you're looking backward. What's the cause? In prospective, in the core study, you, you start with the risk. You are looking for a disease as well, but you are with the factor. You are looking at the factor. You want to see how many of those that are exposed will have the disease. How many of those that are not exposed will have the disease in the future. But there's something about retrospective code. In this situation, it's still the same thing as um, the other code, but in retrospective, the sense that both the exposure and the disease, they have occurred in the past. Is this type of study is common with um, occupational health, where in the uh, in the industry maybe some people are uh, exposed to certain chemical or certain pollutant by the virtue of their work environment over the years, maybe thirty years ago. So maybe ten years ago, which is twenty years after that one, some of them now develop disease. Disease. You now you have a record. So they shall get this one from record. You go to record of company, you can get exposure to certain disease some years, 50 years back, years back. And now you now look at 20 years back or 10 years back, how many of those people, what happened to them? Some of them die of certain disease or have some diseases. So in that situation, both the exposure and the factor, they are in the past. But of course, you can actually select how many of these people were exposed, how many of you were not exposed from the record, and how many later developed the disease. I mean, this develop in both in both category. So it's a core study that is called retrospective cohort. Sometimes when you do your prospective, whatever cohort you do, you can like now you follow up some people, prospective your core study, you follow up some people, and at the end of the after some years, they develop this. So the data you collect also, you may announce, okay, out of these people that develop the disease, and out of you that they have develop the disease. How many of them were exposed? You can, create, can do case control inside the core study. After you have completed a course, study, they call that one next case control. Now, any question, go move forward. So that I don't do the talking too much. Uh, any question? Um, I just wanted you to explain the next case control. Okay. So, what do you mean by this one is. Uh, Let's take case control. You know, imagine now you, you want to study the issue of the lung cancer. So you now have some people that are smoking. So you gather them. You, uh, you begin to look into the future. How many of these people are gathered? How many of them will develop, along the way, develop lung cancer? There are some code, uh, some control people that are 
at the same age, different, and at the same time also, but they, they are not smoking. You follow them up also, you know, how many of them will develop cancer. So by the time you finish, you may be able to tell us, okay, among the people that uh, that uh, smoking, some will develop cancer, some will not develop. Among the people that are not smoking, smoking, some will develop lung cancer, some will not develop. You see now, but the only thing is that if lung cancer is actually uh, the smoking, is really contributing to lung cancer. More of the people, when you look at the proportion wise, more the percentage of people that develop lung cancer will be higher among the smoker than the non-smoker. Now, after you are completed, you can decide to take those people that develop lung cancer, whether they were in, uh, exposed before or they were not exposed. It may be along the, among these people that smoke, it may be among the people that didn't smoke, or the ones that develop lung cancer. You can, you can gather them together as cases. And I guess some, the other people that did not develop lung cancer, whether they were taking a cigarette or they were not taking cigarette, you gather them together, some of them are as, as a control also. And you begin to look backward to really know what the, the, their smoking pattern, maybe how much did they smoke, that is next take control. After you have already finished course study, you now bring out case control for me. Because it will help, because when you were following up, it's possible a lot of things didn't capture. But if you, by the time you, the disease has occurred also, you now do a case control inside that uh, core study. The, the people can still give you more, oh, when I smoke, I smoke every day. You know, not that I was just smoking. My own smoking is just as so, uh, how many stick per day, and uh, even different method, and uh, the reverse smoking, you know? You want to find out what may, uh, some people who smoke, some people smoke, some people did not smoke. Some of the people that smoke, they develop cancer, some did not develop. The people that didn't smoke, some develop, some did not develop. want to know. So if you now do a case control from the same data, and now try to ask more questions about the past, about the nature of the exposure. It's a case control, but it is called nested case control because you got the data from prospective study, the cohort study you have done. Does it make sense? Does it make sense? No response? Yes, it does. Yes. Okay, yes. That's great. Should we proceed? Any other question? No. Yes? Any other? Okay, no other. Dr. Omari, are you, are you following? I'm trying, sir. <laughs> I was trying. What do you mean by is trying? It? What is the trying? I'm, I'm, I'm following, sir. I'm following. Uh -huh. Please, Robo, let me know. Don't try, yes, just follow. Uh -huh. So now, let's look at um, how do you do the comparing? Okay, this issue of, you see, we are just talking about risk, that relative risk is comparing risk. Odd ratio is comparing odds. Though both of them, but they are measure of risk because odd is trying to, whenever you cannot calculate risk, it's a proxy to risk. Whenever you cannot calculate risk, calculate odds. So that's what it just means. So how do we compare this risk? Now, there is something that is peculiar to it. The exposure must be measured on two categories, like things that yes or no, exposed, not exposed. If you have gradient of exposure like ah, I smoke all the time, I smoke sometimes, I smoke once in a while, then don't smoke, doesn't smoke at all. It's not that type you are using. You want to say smoke, no smoke. Smoking, no smoking. Do you see that? Smoking, no smoking. That does it. So it must be in two categories. The outcome also, uh, disease, no disease. Lung cancer, no lung cancer. Either dead or alive. The outcome also must be two categories. So when you now cross tabulate the two, put it on the table, it gives you two by two contingency table. Remember, then for we we'll talk about this contingency table. When you have one variable along the row and that variable along the column as contingent. So 
because each of them are two categories. That's why it is two by two. And this two by two, it creates four sets. And these four sets, they have their own address. Like number, this concordance one are A and D. The discordance cell are C and D. I think you can, you know what it mean by concordance and discordance here. Let us discuss it. It's a workshop. What do you think I mean by concordance and discordance? Why do I call A and D concordance set? B and C discordance set. Anybody explain it? Nobody? Nobody can explain it. Okay. Concordance, when I mean by concordance is. If somebody is talking, you don't, you have to unmute yourself before we can hear you. Many people may be talking and uh, Okay, uh -huh. okay. Um, so it's um, A and D are concordant uh, because um, uh, they contain um, what is expected. So uh, for instance, the exposure um, led to the event of foreign which is what you expect. So that is the concordance. And then the non-exposure uh, led to the event not occurring. Yes. So that is also concordance. Mm -hmm. But the other ones are irrespective of uh, what you would not expect. So despite that they were exposed, events did not occur. That's why they are discordant. Thank you. That's just it. So that's just it. Now, you see, if they have the address A, B, C, D, it's sacrosan. Now, I want to explain how do you calculate a relative risk or ratio? You will see this formula now, but me, I don't like work. Although I will write it there, I don't like working with formula. Let me go to a real life example to explain it. The formula is like crime, crime, crime. And we have, we're going to explain it and run it. Uh, our machine, our software. Look at, in a study, 500 smokers and 1,000 non-smokers were follow up for 10 years to see how many will develop lung cancer. If 25 of the smokers uh, and five of the non-smokers develop lung cancer, respectively, what is the relative risk? of developing lung cancer following smoke. Now, from what we are seeing now, it is obvious that this is a cohort study where you have smoker, non-smoker. Smoking is not a disease. So it's just a factor. So when you start with smoking, not smoking like that, you know that you are starting with a factor. So it's a cohort study. Now, is they are telling us that the people that smoke, so you know that exposure is the factor. The outcome is the disease. So you is good and it's conventional to put the exposure along the horizontal and the outcome along the vertical. Now, the uh, exposure along the horizontal, yes, smoking, total of that is 500. 500 smoke, smoker. Then 1,000, the total for no, is you are not smoking. Everything is 1,500. When the disease now occur later, the people that have lung cancer 30, and the people that have do have lung cancer 1,470. The total is 1,5. Now, what you see in the cell, the concordance cell, 25 and 995. They are 25 are the people that smoke and develop lung cancer. 995 are the people that don't smoke, they don't develop lung cancer. Then 475 are the people that smoke, they didn't develop lung cancer. And five are the people that didn't smoke, they develop lung cancer. Now, how do we calculate our... Before we talk about relative risk, you know that relative risk just means you are comparing two risks by dividing one to the other. Let's first of all calculate the two risks. The two risks you want to calculate, you want to calculate the risk for each level of exposure. Want to calculate this for smokers, those 500. 
We want to calculate this for non-smoker, this 1,000. Now, from the table now, out of the 500, we want to calculate this. how many people develop lung cancer. It's good to be. Okay, we tell 25 over 500. 25 over 500, because the total in that category is 25 that smoke. And in 500 that smoke, 25 of them develop lung cancer. So the risk of, of lung cancer among smoker is 25 over 500. If you like, you can go and explain as percentage or whatever, but 25 divided by 500. Now, the risk of lung cancer among the other group of people which are non smoker is 5 over 1,000. So you, you, from what you see that you can see that 25 out of 500 is bigger than 5 out of 1,000. So of course, is, it appears that the risk of lung cancer is higher among the smoker. So how do we know how many times the person that smoke is more likely to develop lung cancer than the person that did not smoke? is by comparing the risk. Uh, so calculating the risk, relative risk now, the risk to 25 by 500 divided by risk 5 over 1,000, that is the relative risk. We do it to give you 10. What it means is that the smokers are 10 times most likely to develop lung cancer than non-smokers. Does anybody have objection or any question? Because this is very simple. And that is why you just see the formula. If you look at it, that 25 over 500. In the address, 25 is A, this one is B. 500 will be A plus B. This 5 is C, and 995 is D. So 1,000 is C plus D. So when you are not talking of uh, risk among the exposed now, is 25 over 500, which is A all over A plus B. The risk among the non smoker will be 5 over 1,000, which is C, this says C over C plus D. That's all. So that's why you see the relative risk is A over A plus D. You have everything divided by C over C plus D. When you understand the table very well and you understand the address A, B, C, don't yeah, yeah, home and drive. You'll be able to even. When you see the formula, you'll be able to make sense of it. Very good that we have used the example to demonstrate. So now, yes, go on. So we can say that 10 times more likely. Yes. That is. Those, those who are smoking are likely going to have uh, lung cancer. It doesn't mean it, sir. Yes. They are 10 times more likely to have lung cancer than the people that are not smoking. Okay, that's the interpretation. So, any other question on that? You can calculate the origin. I'm not using this one to calculate the origin. The old ratio has its own. Uh, this thing. Look at the this thing now, the formula we are talking of now. Come and see. A over A plus B, C over C plus B. Then let's look at the second example because we want to run it together at the same time. Let's look at the second example that one talk about. Relative or uh, odd ratio. This one is a case control study setting. Of 200 patients uh, patient treated in a hospital, 50 have lung cancer. Of these patients, 45 are smokers. Of the remaining 150 patients, 60 are smokers. What is the odd ratio for smoking? Now, look at the table. You see this table. Right? They are starting with the disease, no disease, they say of 200 patients, 50 have no cancer. So the people that are diseased is 50. The remaining one are 50 are not diseased. They don't have the disease. You can see, look at this in vertical. You see, whether you are dealing with a case control study or cohort study, the logic, the convention still hold. Your exposure is along the horizontal. Your outcome is along the vertical. You will see now the total that have lung cancer is the 50. The total that don't have lung cancer is 150. 
And that's what we are interested in. And when we now look at, if we are to calculate it, you remember what you want to calculate here, since the disease has started, it has occurred. So you cannot calculate risk here. It's hard you want to calculate and then compare the two odds. Now, you remember our formula for the hurt. All is risk over one minus risk. So let's also calculate risk first. Let's calculate among the lung cancer people. Let's calculate the risk of smoking. Because it's about smoking among them now. What is the risk of smoking along the people among? I want it to be interactive. So what is the risk of smoking? You may not give the yes, that's just say something over something. Yes, that's what I want to hear. What is the risk of smoking among the lung cancer people? Who will tell us? Hello. Go on. Yeah, I think the risk of smoking will be. Uh, uh, risk all over one minus the risk. No, we are not talking of hard now. Just risk. What is the risk of smoking? Yeah, among the lung cancer, we have good two group of people we are dealing with. Are dealing with lung cancer, this vertical fence, vertical yes, and no lung cancer. This no. Among these yes here now, this lung cancer. What is the risk of smoking? Okay, it will be forty five or fifty. Yeah, 45 by 50 years, because 45 smoke among the 50 people. The risk of smoking is 45 50. Okay, what is the risk of, of not smoking? The other one is the probability of smoking. What is the probability of not smoking? 60 over 150. Mm -mm. I see along, okay. among the people that have lung cancer, what is the probability of not smoking? You said the probability of smoking 45 or 50. Okay. What is the probability one, of one minus one minus uh, uh, probability of smoking? Uh, how will you do it from here? Okay, let's say one minus it's probability. Over 150. Eh? I say, uh, sorry, um, so what do you say again? What is the Risk of non smoking among the lung cancer people. Okay, it's 90 over 150. Uh, I didn't say along, along the lung cancer. This particular place is the lung cancer. This uh, 90 yes. 150 is no, no, okay. no longer okay. along the lung cancer. Okay. What's the okay. probability of non smoking? Okay. okay, five over 50. Five over 50. Yeah, that's what I want to hear. You know, if the issue is that uh, 45 over 50 is the probability of smoking. Five over 50 is probably not smoking. So the heart of smoking will be 45 over 50 divided by 5 over 50. When you change the subject formula, like it will give you 45 over 5. That is the heart of, of smoking. Is it confusing? Let me write it because uh, let me write it on my screen. Is it confusing? Sounds confusing. No? Okay. I want to write. Let me share again. Okay, oh, I can share my. Yeah, I want to write it here. I want to bring the pen out. Uh -huh. Okay, you say risk of smoking among the lung cancer is 45 over 50. Then the risk of non smoking is 5 over 50. Do you understand that? Yes, sir. You know, heart will be risk over one minus risk. This five over 50 is the same thing as one minus 45 over 50. Do you agree with that? 
Yes. You don't agree because that if you go to remove, if you divide five by 59, remove from one, it will be 45 by 50. So now, the if this is risk of smoking and this one is risk of not smoking, just one minute. No, 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 if you run away, it will go back. What do you have put? 45 over 50. Five over 50. So if you divide it now, since this is the risk of smoking, this is the risk of not smoking. If you now say you are calculating on, now say this divided by this. If you put division here now, you now if you remember your board mass, it will be forty-five over fifty times fifty over five. Do you agree? Please. Let's talk. It's a workshop. Talk, talk. You're allowed to talk. Yes, you sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> you know, this we 50 will cancel 50. It will remain 45 over 5. So, can you see the front that table now? 45 over 5 is the odds of smoking along, among the lung cancer people. If you now want to know the odds of smoking along the lung, um, do that have no lung cancer, is 60 over 90. Because it's the same process, because the probability of smoking among them will be 60 over 115. This probability of not smoking among them will be 90 over 150, which now not smoking is like one minus this one. So when you do it, odd will be odd of smoking will be 60 over 150 divided by 90 over 150. It will be the same process like this. It will give you 60 over 90. Does it make sense? Yes, sir. The 60, it will give you the same answer, 60 over 19. Now, odd ratio, now we want to compare the odd of smoking. This is odd of smoking among the lung cancer. This is odd of smoking among the, among the lung, no lung cancer people. Now, if you want to now compare uh, odd ratio, now you want to do a relative odd. You want to, if you look at it now, which one is bigger? You know that this one is bigger, 45 over 50 over five is bigger than 60 over 19. You agree with me? Yes. If you now divide it now, you want to, that's relative uh, odd ratio or relative odds. So just like the same way we're doing the other time, 45 over 50, over five rather, times 90 over 60. So if this one's cause this zero cause zero, three here, two, three here, three. So if you multiply this one, then uh, five here, five here in 45, nine. So nine times three, 27, 27 over two. They give you 30.5. The answer is 13.5. Does it make sense? Yes, sir. So the odd ratio now is 30.5. Now, it's telling you that the people that have lung, that have lung cancer, they are 30.5 times more likely to have smoke. That's what you calculated, can you see now? That is this, this is the value. 
34, 5, 5 more likely to have smoked before than the people with that lung cancer. Does it make sense? Yes, sir. Yeah. So let's run it. When we run it now, I will go back. Okay. If you, there's, there's something I wanted to tell you, I've not told you. If you look at it now, when we now say where we times it, 45 times 19 over this one, this way before we start cutting, this when we do the change of subjects, 45 over 5 times. 19 over 60. Look at 45 is A. Then also 19 is D. Hmm? B is 16. 5 is C. So that's why there's all ratio A D divided by B C. Can you see now? Yes, Cross product. Does it make sense? Yes. I'm talking to the public. Is Dr. Lamingo by Aran? Sir. You have come, okay. You came late today also, like yesterday. Yes, so yes, that is why they say odd ratio AD. Can you see? Can you see 45 times 19, which is A and D times D divided by over 5 times 60, which is C and B. Let me just show, let me just go back and so to those formulas, I didn't want to bother you. Can you see? Look at it. The relative risk is this. The odd ratio is this. There is something we're going to, can you see AD over BC or CB or whatever, BC. So let's move forward. Look at the cross products. Odd ratio, can you see? A D over B C. That's what they call it cross product. Now let's run the analysis from there. There are a lot of issues want to unfold about odd ratio and relative risk. So let's run the analysis now. So let someone want to run the two. Let somebody read that first one. We'll start with the relative risk. The first one that talk about the uh, The title is smoking or smoke lung cancer. Smoking lung cancer or smoke lung cancer. You see smoke lung cancer. Smoking lung cancer. Yes? Enable us from the city. Okay, okay. Let me enable. Sorry. So you can share now. Okay, that's great. Now, something I want you to see, you will see that, you see the smoking, the first, you see the lung cancer, the second, after the serial number. You will see that they are all enter in series. You know, you see, yes, there are the people that don't smoke, no, all those stuff. Now, go to analyze. Now, I told you anything, when you say cross tabulate, it's for proportion. Analyze descriptive statistic cross tab. Still the same cross tab. Okay, smoking exposure. The row should be the row. Then lung cancer, then go on, click on statistics. You see risk, click on risk. Then, okay, continue, okay, that's all.
So show all the results. Okay, I expand it. Yes. Can we see? See the, you see, you know, the computer is garbage in, garbage out. It has given you, if you look at the initial table, it gives you all those A, B, C, all those, it just arrange it for you. Then look at odd ratio, you calculate the odd ratio. Computer does not know which one is core study, which one is a case control study or whatever. Computer is garbage in, garbage out. So they, they give it to you, whichever one. It is you that know which one is applicable. So here now you are not looking at odd ratio, you are looking at relative risk. Look at the core lung cancer is equal to yes, that is the relative risk, 10. That was what we calculated. So we'll come back to this confidence interval. Let somebody, maybe another person, read your own uh, lung, uh, lung cancer smoke. This one is smoking lung cancer, this uh, five. There's another file, long cancer so Normally, you should read and share. You can stop sharing. Any question or concerning this, we're still coming back to look at it. Or you, anyway. You, uh, Dr. Lamingo, open, go and open that folder and uh, that file and run that one also. I want it to be together because I want to demonstrate, I want to show you something concerning the two results. Okay, sorry. Okay, that's great. Now, analyze. Where are you going? It's analyze now, it's not view. I want to remove that thing. Okay, analyze. Go to the same place. The same, exactly the same thing. Cross tab. Go to move, smoke, yes. The outcome is lung cancer. Go to statistics. Risk. Yeah, okay, you have to share the result here. So can you see, odd ratio, look at the table, first of all, give us that table. Look at odd ratio, 30 point. <laughs> now, I want to look at, you can see now 30.3, it tells you, it also gives you a relative risk. You don't need it for this one, but we can, when you give data, every data set, there's relative risk for it, there's odd ratio for it. Now, I want us to, how do you interpret this confidence interval? So before we do that, you can stop sharing, let me share my slide, to come and explain this confidence interval. I think this is where we stopped with uh, this movie yesterday. I stopped yesterday. Well, we've gone far. I said, let's just stop. So all this one, I just, these are the results you have run. Okay, I would have even, then. So if you have been following our lecture, you know that, what is confidence interval? Confidence interval is a range of value within which you are to certain extent or degree confident that you will find the population value. That if you, like, for example, now the first odd ratio, you know, the relative risk was 10. 
That is what you got from the sample. That is your sample. But in the population, because sample we are talking about, how many of them? Maybe 150 people or 400 or whatever. That's probably, you calculate that relatively from the sample. If it were to be possible that all the elements in the population, all those who that are in that, in the population you are studying, all those things that are in that category you are studying, all of them are involved. That is the population itself. What should be the value? It may not be the same. It may not, if you use the whole population to calculate it, you may not get the same result. So the real value in the population is called parameter. This one you are just relatively, you are just calculated or all ratio is statistic. But the key thing is parameter. So you want to be, since you are not sure, in the realm of inferential statistics, you want to be, to a certain extent, sure that, okay, even though this is what I uh, have uh, estimated, this is what we call point estimate, but I want to give interval estimate so that in the population, we, are, we are can boldly say that between this and this, if maybe I calculated the I say between three and 15, that's what the, all the relative risk will be in the population. I'm 95% sure, confident. So that is the interpretation of 95% confidence interval. Now, there's another thing I've not said. You know, it's about dividing one risk by another risk. That's what they call it relative risk or risk ratio. Or dividing one odd by another odd, relative odd or odd ratio. When you divide two things, imagine the risk among the exposed that have a denominator is the same value as the risk. Both of them are the same as the risk among the non exposed. What would be the relative risk? Let somebody give me an answer. If the risk is the same, what would be the relative risk? Unmute yourself and talk. One. It's one, yes. Because when you divide, when denominator is equal to numerator, it's one. So if the risk is the same in both groups, and you calculated the risk for both of them, or all from them, I now divide it, it will be one. It means that, forget it. That, that is whether you smoke or you don't smoke has nothing to do with lung cancer. Has nothing to do with it when the risk is one. And that should have been no hypothesis is true. There's no association between lung cancer and smoking. Does it make sense? The odd ratio or relative risk, any of them, reduce if the work. If the risk is the same. Now, if the risk is higher with the numerator, which is most of the time is the, if it is a core study, that is the group that I expose. If it is the, uh, the other study case control, you are talking of the, the group that have the disease. If the risk is higher in the denominator, what will happen is that the, it will be greater than one. When something is bigger than the denominator, numerator is rather, if numerator is greater than denominator, it will give you value that is greater than one. That shows that that exposure is causing the disease. Now, if the risk may be smaller among the exposure, of course, the numerator, that one is numerator that the, the risk among the exposure will be smaller in value. The denominator will be bigger. When you divide, it gives you zero point something. Whenever the risk is zero, less than one, zero point something, that shows that that particular thing is protective. It's just like now, somebody, you're talking of vaccine. Somebody, they give vaccine for against measles. And later, as you okay, some children, the people that receive vaccine, what is the risk of the disarmament people who develop measles? The people that did not receive vaccine, how many people develop misery? You will see that the risk 
of measles will be higher among people that didn't receive vaccine. So if you now put the people that receive vaccine over people that didn't receive that the risk among the risk among the people that receive vaccine that is the numerator will be smaller, which will give you zero for something. What is telling you that exposure is protective? That shows that the vaccine is working, is protective. So when you are when the risk is greater than one, the odd ratio or relative risk is greater than one, it means that that factor, yes, is causing the disease. But if the risk is less than, if the odd ratio or relative is less than one, that factor, because you have made the factor the numerator, the group factor is the numerator, that shows that they, that factor is protective. Any question before we move forward? I see all that thing I need to explain. Any question? Any other? Any question on what I just said about interpreting it? So that's what I put here. If the relative to the odd ratio is, is close to one, there is no association between exposure and development of disease. A relative to the odd ratio greater than one indicates a positive association between exposure and a relative risk or odd ratio less than one means an exposure is associated with the less disease and may be protected. The relative risk or odd ratio is often reported as a single number followed by a confidence interval in parentheses. If the range of confidence interval include why we are going there, then the result is not significant. Please, any question? No question, is it? If you are talking, you are muted. Unmute yourself. Because most of the time, when people are not talking, maybe that they are talking, but they are muted. They don't know we are not hearing anything. Doctor, this guy is about four, five again. Eh? Number four, five. I don't understand. What did you say? Number four and number five. Okay. Please explain it to me. Okay. Okay, that number four, four. We yes. number five is what I'm going to explain. Now. But let me explain. Over. We are still going to number five, don't worry. But number four, they say the relative real or ratio is often reported as a single number, followed by a confidence interval. What it just means that this relative, this odd ratio now, 30.2 and 30.5, we calculated. You will now put in bracket a confidence interval, 95% confidence at 5.072. 35.9 or 36. So when you coach your relative risk or horse ratio, you now put the confidence interval in parentheses in bracket. That is what the number four is saying. Do you understand that now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So any other one, I will go to number five, don't worry. Number five is what we want to explain here. That confidence interval, hmm? For the fact that we have already known that if the relative risk or hold ratio is one, there's no association of any kind. The T is neither protective nor, nor, nor causing the disease. It means that it has nothing to do with this cell. Nothing to do with this. So they are going different way. They have nothing to do with each other. The disease and the exposure in question or the exposure and the disease in question has nothing to do if the value is one. But for the fact that the value is greater than one or less than one, if it's greater than one, we know that that thing may be causing it. If it's less than one, it may be protected. It may not be significant. No. How do we know if it is significant? There are three scenarios painted here do no, four diagram, but there are actually three scenarios. If look at the middle of the this middle are the value of the relative risk or odd ratio. This one, the this is the lower level of confidence interval, upper level. You know when you see the odd ratio and you see the confidence interval, the lower value of the confidence interval will be less than the odd ratio, and the upper will be higher. That's because it's a, it, 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 it will be somewhere in the middle, the value you calculated. But you are confident in the population, it will be ranged from this to this. Now, 
So by convention, if you mark this middle as the relative risk or confidence or hot ratio, this the beginning of this line is the lower lower limit, is the lower upper limit for the confidence interval. Look at all these three scenarios. Now we already known that non hypothesis is true when the odds ratio of relative risk is one. It means there's no association. So if after you have your look at this value now, this this value, this one here, this less than one, this greater than one, this value, what is telling us that uh, the odd ratio and for these two diagram is zero point something, is less than one. But for this one. It ranges from a value less than one and still end in a value less than one. But this one, it ranges from a value less than one and hence in a value greater than one. It has crossed one to this side, positive side. No positive side, but say anything greater than one, no positive. Look at this third one. It, even though these last two, their odd ratio and relatively are greater than one. But for this one, the values, the lower limit of the confidence interval started from something less than one, zero point something, and hence something after one. Why for this one, it starts from something after one, and hence something after one. So where we can see actually four scenarios. So the first, if you look at the as written, this first and the last, they are significant. This middle two, they are not significant. You know who can tell me why these two are not significant? These two in the middle are not significant. It's a workshop. Tell somebody answer. Who can tell, who can tell us why they are not significant? Their values include one. Eh? Their values include one. Yeah, the value include one. Because we already, you know, you are telling me that, oh, uh, for this one, and I say, oh, my odd ratio is 1.5. Yes. But uh, the confidence interval is from 0 0.8 to 3.2. What is telling you that in the population, the value you are 95% percent confident that even though I've calculated 1.54, it may be something from 0 0.8, which is less than one, to something like 3.2. It can be any value in between. It can be 0 0.8, it can be 0 0.89, it can be 0 0.9, it can be 1. In as much that 1 is part of what it can be. And you already know that when it is 1, relative this or all this is 1, it's not significant. It means there is nothing, no association. So, in as much, so it could have been if it's one of the possible values in the population, that should have, it's not significant. It's the same thing for this one. Even though the relative risk or odd ratio is less than one, maybe zero point something, but the, uh, the confidence interval is zero. If this one less than this one is 0 0.8, and this one I give you 0 0.3 to 2.5. Since it has crossed, it has included one. But this one I will be something like 0 0.3 to 0 0.9. It's significant. This one will be something like maybe 2.5 to 7.4. It's significant. The reason is this one, the difference between these two is that this one, everything here is greater than one. Everything here is less than one. This one that everything here is less than one is protective. It's telling you that the, the, the thing is supposed to be 0.0, so it's protective. Why this one is causing, the factor is causing the event. This one, the factor is not causing the event. And both of them are significant. But this one in the middle, this one is telling us because the value is less than one, the factor is protective, but it's not significant because in the population, it can look as if it's protective. It can be any value as one, as if it's not protective, whatever. So the issue there is in as much that the value will include one in the range, not significant. This one, we say that, oh, this one is causing the disease, but because the limit is starting from zero point something as if it's not, as if it's protective. And here he's saying that it's causing it. So seeing as one that it has, it has included one, the value one is one of the possible value, it's not significant. But this one is significant, everything is significant, it's causing it. any question concerning.
interpretation of confidence interval of ordering of ratio. Please unmute yourself. You are talking. Any question? Now, there are some things I want you to realize. False ratio serve as proxy to relative rates. What do you mean by that? I think we have talked about it. And by the time the disease is real, the more it is real, the odd ratio approximate relative risk. What do I mean? You know, we have already said that it is when you cannot calculate the risk, you calculate the disease as a core, that type of study, before you do your study, the disease as a core, that's where you calculate horse ratio. But at the beginning of your study, the event has not occurred to calculate relative risk. When the probability of an event happens is rare, the odd and probability are close. One thing there is that whenever, you know, we demonstrated at the beginning, when I was showing you probability and odds, and I told you that sector, when the probability is very small, that is the probability of a disease very, of event very, very small, the risk and event are, and the odd, they are very close. The value of the odd, very very close. I even on the table I show you also. I show you that uh, when probability is zero, the odds is zero. As probability is getting closer to zero, the odds is getting closer to the value of probability. They are getting same. So the reason is that A is much more. I look at this formula. If you remember, what is the formula for relative risk? We say A all over A plus B, everything over C plus D. If you remember, I mean, I want to use the pen. I don't know where it's. It's the pen. Unless I stop sharing, I share again. I want to use the pen to write. <laughs> Now, look at this. A, you remember relative risk. Ah, this one is TQ. Ah. Relative risk is got to A. divided by what you are seeing, A plus B, everything over C divided by C plus D. Now, when the disease is rare, you know, if you remember, in that cell, A is the one that has the disease. You remember, the two by two, when no doctor artist said, discordant, concordant, those four. A, these are the people that, are, yes, disease, they exposed. This is B, this C, it is T. You know that here is the A plus B the total horizontal here, the number of people that are exposed. This is C plus D in that table. Now, whenever, if the disease is here, this is the disease, yes, or disease. This is no disease. So if the disease is here, A and C are the ones that have the disease. So, if the disease is here, A all over A plus B will be approximate A over B. 
in the sense that this, the value of this A will be infinitesimally small compared with B. Almost everything that constitutes A plus B will be that B alone. Now, then everything over C, since the disease here, even among the non exposed, it is very small. C over D. And you remember this one, A over B, which is what we are just reading, divided by, that's what I mean, I'm writing in a different way you can understand, over, divided by C over D. So it's the same thing as writing A over B times D over C. Remember, which is AD over BC. Is that not the formula of uh, odds ratio? Yes. 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 AB over BC. So the formula of relative risk now, when the disease is real, is changed to formula of odds ratio. So whenever the disease is real, the odds ratio approximate relative risk. So it even makes sense. Imagine when the disease is there now. If you can, if you go and say you are conducting relative uh, cohort study, that you will calculate relative risk, you may waste your resources at the end of the day. You may not see anything to analyze. But if you now change it to use it for, you now use case control to do to look for people that are already getting diseases, and now use case control and now calculate relative uh, odds ratio. What they are telling you is that because it's a real disease, what you get, the value of all ratio you get will, uh, will be very close to what it will really serious will have been if you have calculated, uh, you have conducted cohort study. Does it make sense? So it's God that means like that. So when the disease is real, the value of all ratio approximate that of relative. Just like the way the value of odds. Approximate that of risk. Does all ratio approximate relative when the disease source, when sources are there? All ratio is sometimes referred to as approximate relative risk. Look at the table here, it's demonstrating the same thing. Here is talking of this population, population one, population two. Uh, so it's kind of trying to look less well, less sample sample two. It's time to look at what is the relative risk where you, the risk, this is the risk in this population. This is the risk prevalence, sorry, it's not prevalence, it's prevalence in each population. This is prevalent here for of, uh, exposed, prevalence of disease, which is the risk among non exposed. Relatively, if you now divide this by this, give you two. You will see something. As the, look at the prevalence is higher here. Is higher here also. The issue is that as the privilege becoming higher, is becoming higher in both. So to the extent that their relative risk is the same, old, but the odds ratio, look at the value. The odds ratio, when the disease, this first one is where the disease is rarest. So you are having 0 0.1 and 0 0.5. Can you see this case? Can you see? That is where you have the lowest. Or ratio. Can you see the, the relative risk for all of them is the same? Because let's start from this one. This is 70% here among the K uh, exposed, 35% among the non-exposed. When you so 70%, half of it is 35%. So it's two times more likely. Is 50% here, 25% here, is still two double. Is three 30% here, 50% here, is still double. Is ten percent here and five percent is double. But what from the base now? The disease is common now among the one. But as you are going to the first row, this one, the disease becoming the other. Look at there. Even though the relationship between them is maintained, that the relative risk is two, but the corresponding odd ratio begin to get closer to relative risk. Can you see? As the disease becoming rare, the prevalence becoming smaller. The value of odd ratio. Look at it. Here now, all ratio 
is 4.3 to the relative risk two. Here, odd ratio is three. So it's getting closer to relative risk until. If this is, you can see another value that is smaller than this, at the end of the day, you see that odd ratio will be zero point, almost two, rather two point something, zero one. Does it make sense? Any question in that regard? Just to establish the father when disease is here. Yeah. So I can even deform the result. Okay, let me go back. You mean the reason I even ask you to do I want to go back to the because I have you know the result you run, I've already put it on the slide before. So look at let's look at the result. Let's look at this scenario. Look at this first scenario and the second scenario. This one, where you have, let's look at this one. Let's look at the total people that have disease here, lung cancer here, 30, the people that don't have 1,470 out of 30 have lung cancer out of 1,450. Compare with this one, 50 have lung cancer out of 200. Which one, is the, where is the disease real at between the two? Where will, you, where will you say the disease is real? Let's talk to this uh, workshop. Nobody is answering. On the first chart. Yeah, the first one, the disease is real and therefore because it's common here. Because 50 long cuts out of 200 is more common than 30 out of 1,500, right? You agree? So the disease is rarer in the first case. Now, let's look at the results we got. This is the first case. I mean, this is the first case, or no, this is the second case. Look at that first case now. Look at what am I doing? Look at that first case. Look at the result of the first. Let's compare their whole ratio and relative risk now. <coughs> For this first case, you see the disease here. You see the odd ratio is 10.47 and relative risk is 10. The difference between them is just 0.47. Can you see? Let's look at the second case. That second case when we're running, the odd ratio is 30.5. The relative is 8.14. Can you see? Because the disease is common here, there's much gap between relative risk and odd ratio. But because this disease is rare in that one, there's little gap. Does it make sense? So, sir, so, sir, 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 sir. yes, what relative risk is not yet. This one means relative risk is 0.143. Relative risk here is 8.143, and odd ratio is 30.5. For the same data set, for the same scenario, that far, look at this table where 50 people have lung cancer out of 200. If you calculate for that data set, you know you can calculate it. It's you that decide you can, computer will calculate it for you, it's a scenario. But the issue when you are doing your study, you should that will say, oh, this study is case control, is the relative, is odd ratio I'm using, yeah. It's not, yeah. Oh, this study is a core study or experimental, is the relative I'm using. If it is case control, I'm using core uh, uh, odd ratio. But the issue is that, uh, the computer there is all ratio relative for every scenario. So for this scenario where the disease is 50 out of 500, look at the distance between the all ratio and relative risk. Eh? Yes. It's big, bigger compared with this other one. When you say the disease is real, the real 30 out of 1,500 is real. Look at the distance, it's just 0 0.474. So whenever the disease is real, the value of odd ratio approximate that of relative risk, very close to that of relative risk. Does it make sense? Yes, sir. Well, was raising a question. Yes, Any, which question? So, sir, when we are going to write the result answer, are we going to write both of them or we'll just choose one? No, no, no. It depends on the study you are doing. Huh? You cannot choose both. If the study, the data, you know, the computer does not know this data. Is it coming from experimental design? The data from experimental design, is it different? 
Et de, de, j'ai un truc de data, il comprend que ah, this is an experimental design, uh, design data that are coming, or cross study that are coming to the computer, or uh, cross sectional or case control. No. And they, because when any data like that, they just, you know, you have click on risk, you will calculate different, everything that you may think of, you want to get, they calculate it for you. It's you that know. I think that no, oh, this my study is core study. What I'm calculating here is relative risk. Or this my study is cross sectional study or case control study. What I'm calculating here is odd ratio. Does it make sense? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now, any other question from any angle? What I see some other thing we need to unfold. Concerning this cost ratio and relative risk. Okay. Yes. This issue of the cocoa dance discount. I didn't get it clearly, sir. Okay. Look at this table I'm showing you now. This one on this output. So you will see that along the horizontal we are spoken. Can hmm? you see? Yes, sir. We have along the vertical, we have lung cancer. Now, smoking, there are two options, either yes or no. We know that the total that smoke is one 500. The total that don't smoke, 1,000. Everything total will be 1,500. When you look to the, the column side, the total that have lung cancer is 30. The computer I don't have is 1,470. And when you add it together, it's still 1,500, whichever way you are coming from. Now, this one, I'm just explaining at the periphery, they are just the total, all this one. They are just the total. Yes, I mean, they are just the total. The lead says are these four, 25, 475, Five nine nine five. Now, what we mean by concordant is that these people they smoke because we want to see if smoking contribute to lung cancer. That's why Dr. Acti say expectation. These people smoke, and these people they have lung cancer. So twenty five is twenty five of them smoke and have lung cancer. It's a form of concordant. Because he got what he deserves. Do you get it now? He smoked, he got the disease. Yes, yes. It's a concordant. Then another concordant is this. This 995. Smoking, no, it's not smoke. Cancer, no. He get what he deserves. If they didn't smoke, they didn't have lung cancer. Those are concordants. Does it make sense? Yes, sir. Now, the discordance now are the ones that get what they did not serve. Now, this person smoke and no low cancer. This 475, they smoke, they didn't get low cancer. It's a discordance. That is a yes, no. And these five people, so they didn't smoke, they got lung cancer. It's a discordance. So you know the difference between coconut and this color? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. This thing is not limited to only the, we just use for explanation because any two by two table, you get it like that, coconut and this color. I think we explain, okay, we, we know, is it Dr. Morrigan that asked the question? Yes, sir. And you were not around yesterday because yesterday, we talked about this coconut and this color for when we were discussing McNema and McNema Parker. Test, chi square test. So, no worry, when I have the time with you, you see. So, I think we go ahead. Any other question? Okay. Now, there are some things we want to explain here. Just to see, explain further. Relationship between 
relative heat and odd ratio T for them. When the event occurs equally in both the exposed and the non-exposed, relative risk is one and odd ratio is one. You remember I said that? Huh? You remember? When yes. you get one where both numerator and denominator is the same. So that's the disease occur both in the exposed and non-exposed. Because you put the exposed group as numerator, non-exposed as denominator. When the disease occur at the same rate there, so numerator will be equal to denominator into one. In that situation, relative risk will be one. The odds ratio will be one. Now, the odd ratio is always further away from one than the relative risk. So I was saying something, I don't know if it's today or yesterday. That we, I said that you get to know that. Because, okay, I said it yesterday. And when I was explaining that uh, the first table I share, I was explaining about odd and risk. Probability of risk is from zero to one. Why hold is from zero to infinity? When probability travel halfway, that is to zero to zero point five, that's the halfway because the highest is one. The hold has double what probability has done by being one. So when probabilities travel the second half with completion, the hold has gone to space, has gone to infinity. Now, what is, the pressure this one is giving that uh, the relative risk is relative risk uh, is greater than one, the corresponding odd ratio would be greater than relative risk. But if relative risk is less than one, the corresponding odd ratio will be less than relative risk. So let's see from this graph. Let's see for this graph is you look like this. At the vertical axis, they plot the odds ratio. You know, at the horizontal axis, they plot the risk ratio. Hmm? This ratio, odds ratio vertical. Let's pin something. Let's look at relative risk. This is, look at the value of one, look at 0 0.5. Look at one here. Let me do proper. Sorry. That thing is like you cannot change it until you. Uh, let me use proper touch. Look at here. Yeah. This is the relative risk of one. If let's say, just, just pick a point now. Let's pick this point. Odd ratio and uh, relative is 2.5 here. So it's greater than one now. Begin to go, where does it meet? But where it meets the line, it joins the line. That is where you can calculate the corresponding odd ratio. Relative first first time with one. Relative risk is one here. If you look at where he joined this line, he joined this one as one also of odd ratio. So when the exposure, the risk among the exposure and the risk among the outcome is the same, relative risk would be equal to odd ratio. Both of them, both of them would be one. That's what you are saying. But when the odd ratio, the relative risk rather, is greater than one, look at, let's give it this 2.5 now. Trace it where you join the graph. You will see, join the graph here. Yeah? What is the corresponding value of odd ratio? It's greater than 2.5. Can you see? Are we following where this one joined this graph now? If the relative is relative 2.5, this is where you join the graph. Though there are different. This, Let's just shoot any of them. Let's shoot this blue one. Can you see if you not trace back? I'm ah, sorry. You will see that where it joins it, this blue one is higher than 2.5. So when what is telling you is that whenever the 
relative value of relative risk is greater than one, the corresponding odd ratio is greater than relative risk. Ask question, please. Do you understand what I've just explained? Or mute yourself if you want to talk. Is somebody there? Are you yes, there? Sir. Or you people are sleeping? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Do you understand what yeah, I just yeah. Do you understand what yeah, I just said? Huh? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So now let's look at the situation where relative risk is less than one. Let's look at this 0 0.5 here. When you trace where it joined this something, look at it. Odd ratio is less than relative risk. So relative risk is 0 0.5, but odd ratio is less than 0 0.5. Can you see? When the relative risk is less than one, the corresponding odd ratio is less than relative risk. Can you see? So when we have 0 0.5 relative risk now, the odd ratio corresponding to is less than 0 0.5. But when the relative risk is greater than one, the corresponding odd ratio is greater than relative risk. Is it difficult to conceptualize? It's clear. It's very clear, right? So I'm yes, happy sir. that it's very clear. That's what that your graph is showing. Now, the one thing here is that uh, most of the time, this is just a formula to convert relative risk to, to convert odd ratio to relative risk. So it's some guys that did that because most of the time, when you are, when you want to do maybe uh, economic evaluation, want to know the cost of a particular program, health program, whatever, when you search literature for that particular study they have done, you discover in that area, you have more literature that quoted odd ratio than relative risk. You know that the estimation, the real estimation of the risk is the relative risk. Odd ratio is just a proxy, something that standing him. So if care is not taken, by the time you, you go and estimate using uh, maybe even sometimes they do meta analysis to gather many and now come with a particular value of odd ratio. That odd ratio is not actually giving the exact risk. You are not sure it give the exact risk of that disease. And the reason people use odd ratio is that it's easier to carry out the study that will produce odd ratio than the study. Easier per se is not as cheap, it's easier as per the right goal involved in the study. It's more possible, yes, it's easier, it's very better to say, it's more, the possibility is more. Because most of the, um, the study that will require you calculating risk, number one, they can be expensive. The futurist, any study, that will require you to look into the future. No, it's very expensive because you know that there will be attrition. You will be forced to even increase sample size. And when you increase sample size, you spend more money because you know that, oh, if I'm following these people up for 20 years, yeah, are you sure that I will be able to track all of them for 20 years? If I need maybe 800 for my Disney, I would rather go and go for close to 2,000 because I know that somehow, somehow, many people will fall out before I conclude the study. So you see, the most of the study that we now calculate relative risks are very expensive to conduct. So in this research, what said many times, what to do so is you don't have fun just to manage. So you have to do the one that will be feasible. Not necessarily that it's less rigorous, in the methodology bed is more visible. In fact, sometimes the apart from the cost, the those ones that require them may be easier to conduct in real life. 
that require more money. While the other one that doesn't require may be difficult to even control when it comes to the right goal involved. But the issue is that it is more possible to conduct study that will calculate relative risk you know, or odd ratio than that of relative risk. Because of that, you're able to, when you have calculated your relative risk or odd ratio, especially if it is meta analysis you even do, you can now use this formula to calculate, to convert that odd ratio to what it might have been or it will have been if you have calculated relative risk. So where the last thing I actually talk here, which is optional, is how do you judge this association? You remember this issue of relative risk ratio? We call them measures of association. Do you know why? We look at this, able to tell you how many times this group will likely have the attribute than the other group, and also give you the level, a range of value within which you can find the population value, which is the confidence interval. So it makes it to be preferable to use P value. Many times when people they, they do study, if you can put your relative risk or ratio, either or ratio or relative with the confidence interval, you don't need to put P value. In fact, when you do that, you are, you are, you are, you are presenting two inferential methods. <laughs> because there are two inferential methods you are presenting. One is the hypothesis testing, which is the P value. And the other one is confidence interval. And the confidence interval give more information than, relative, than uh, P value. The confidence, I, I thought I have the evil side here of this thing I'm saying. Okay, I don't have it here. The p value gives only one information. The information it gives is it is significant or it is not significant. That's all. That is, so it's telling that ah, the probability that the result you have gotten is due to chance. It gives it to you. If the probability that ah, these differences I'm observing now with my eyes is due to chance, the probability is extremely low, extremely low. And I say, oh, significant, we cannot say it's due to chance. So that's what the people can do for you. But the confidence interval we give you. Help you quantify just like the way you did all ratio of relative risk. Help you quantify the association. One, you can also know the range of value within which you can find the population value. Two, three, you can also know if it's significant or not by what we have just said. If it cross one, if it crosses one, the range of value cross one is not significant. If it cross, if it doesn't cross one, it's significant. When we come to confidence interval of the mean, different between me, it's a different ball game because that one, instead of using one as the reference, we use zero as the reference. When we get to, and that will be the next week uh, training, I talked about comparison of mean, of two mean. So we talk about confidence interval of the difference between me. And that one, uh, it give you the difference between me and give you the confidence interval, a range of value with you, with you, you can find the population difference. And that one, in interpreting that one, it is when it, is, it cross zero, not one. And when we get there, we're going to see the logic behind it because this one is one because it's about division. Why that one is about minus, that's why that one is zero. When we get there, we explain that concept. Again, you need to be able to differentiate. Now, after you have, <clears throat> you have done your study, you say, oh, this is relative risk of 10 confidence level of this is significant. But it doesn't mean that it's clinically significant. When we say 
Statistical significant does not mean clinical significant. Now, when statistical association emerge from research, the next step is to judge what type of association exists. Statistical association do not necessarily imply, imply causal association. But if I say that, ah, this, you can see now in this study, hmm, people that smoke, they are 10 times more likely to have lung cancer than you that don't smoke. Ha. Lung cancer is the, the smoking that causes lung cancer. It may not be so. Association statistically does not mean cause association. Although several classifications is a simple approach classification association into three. We have spurious observation, association, indirect, or cause. The effect of selection bias, if it's spurious now, if there are bias, it's spurious also. Many times when you run your, you do your contribution, you do kite scale, you see the you know, Most of them are spurious association because there are a lot of bias, a lot of information bias, a lot of things involved. No, about that. Now, indirect association stem from confounding and arrive, but no cause. And meet some people with some things that are cause confounding, but it's no reason. Then, cause due to cause effect relationship. Cause mean that that thing is the one causing it and it's causing the effect. So, how do we now know whatever you get for your statistics, your audit, or whatever? From you, uh, forget about you may do the confidence that I may show that it's significant. It does not just mean anything still that that is causal. So what do you do to decipher, to really know? Judgment of cost relation can be tough, but there's a man called Bradford Hill in 1965 published a list of criteria that need to be considered when assessing whether an association is likely to be causal. This point serves as a general view guide and I'm not meant to be an inflexible list, even that one also is a guide. Not all criteria must be fulfilled to establish scientific causation. These are the criteria brought for you presented. Now, they are arranged according to how important they are. Can you see? Number one is the most important, followed by two, three, four, like that. The last is the least important. Now, you see the criteria and the question posed. The first on the list is temporal sequence. That is the, the exposure received at court. You can adjust like what I said before. Somebody developed, somebody uh, you see the person is having hypertension. And that says because he's not washing his weight. No, look at your weight. The person can tell you that look, he was slender when he started having high blood pressure. It's later that because of the thinking in the now, now view. So it was not this being big that caused the blood pressure. Because to that person, the obesity did not precede the person's hypertension. If let's say the person has been obese for some time, for long, and it wasn't hypertension, and later it became hypertension, you cannot say, okay, the obesity be a contributing factor. So if something that like didn't occur before, how can it be called the cause? You're like somebody that falls. He now has a stone block, a stone in the front. Is it the stone? I don't need the stone in the front now. That made it fall. So if they say there are stone on the road, that's why it fall. They say I don't need the stone. So temporal sequence. Temporal means the what is causing something come before the, the outcome. If you say that there's a uh, is my, um, Fasipara malaria, parasite, as well as cause malaria. Somebody that is not infected cannot have the malaria. That's just, that, that is not exposed. 
There is no bite by the mosquito. We don't have the malaria. So temporal sequence. Then the second, that is the most important. That's the first one, look at it. If that one's not there, just forget it. Strength of association. How strong is the effect measure as energy to this, as energy release or other ratio? Let's like what we did now. If you do other ratio, you don't see something like two, one point something. Even if you say it's significant, something two times more likely, one time. Compared with this one, like 10 times more likely. So maybe we will do it 20 times more likely. The strength of association, the bigger the strength, the, the more you are not likely to share that thing. You have to look very well. Strength of association. The third one is consistency of association. So if work was done and you get something, and later another person do the work, you didn't get the same thing. Be careful. But if several work has been done over and over and over and over and over and over, and it's pointing to the same thing, then I you see that the material consistency of the association as it felt be by others. Then biological gradient, those stress one. If the more the factor, the more the severity or the probability of the disease or the severity, you know that is really uh, causing it. It's just like uh, if you study the, the, the severe and the lung cancer, you now see that you begin to analyze. It's like more of the people that take for longer period or they take more cigarettes per day, more of them develop lung cancer. You know that more that's a great, that's a biological gradient, those response relation. So if you look at it, the importance is going down, going down. Then specificity of association. Though the exposure lead only to the act of that something that that's the only thing they cause. It don't cost any other thing. If that's the only thing they cause, you know that uh, uh, you now see that that's the only, you see that that person has it. It's the one causing it. So that's specificity. But if you look at it also, it's not as important as the others in the front. Then we have biological possibility. So the decision makes sense. Biological sense. Like for example, now, you just see, you explain what is the pathu, a uh, pathogenesis, it doesn't make sense. You know, particularly you as doctor of pathology look at it, you try to explain how does it cause it. It doesn't make biological sense. So it has, if it makes biological sense, yes, it contributes. But if you look at this, it, it's not as important as the rest because there are many things people think that they don't make biological sense, but it do happen. Let me give you an example. Long before they discover bacteria jam theory of disease that is jam that's causing infection you no know, medicine started with a magic or those of people they appear to cause the physician they just feel that uh, you know the the perform the practice medicine with jam with with a uh, with sham with magic and many things not like all the uh, all these herbalists you know that's why in africa we are still rudimentary uh, the whole world was like that before and uh, even outside the country, all those advanced countries, it was like that before. They combined the Jew medicine to practice medicine. But it was later when the scientific knowledge increased that people that need to look for evidence. But long before they could get the evidence that it was John, John theory of, uh, of disease causation. So people discovered that any place that is very dirty, they are more likely to get sick. So that was, uh, in those Roman Empire, in those days, the you drainage, the wash city, everything clean, and they describe the mortality, the rate of disease drop, the mortality drop, everything drop. Even they didn't know what is causing it, but they just know that it has something to do with this dirty environment. But how the dirty environment, nobody knew. knew. So sometimes, for the first time, that, so when people just say, and do use this one. It's just like uh, where well, you go to the realm of faith now. You know, in science, you don't want to anything you don't see. It doesn't exist. And there are some things that go beyond also. So for the fact that uh, they say, uh, some people don't believe that if somebody pray for them, they can be healed. 
Well, you cannot explain it. I can somebody just lie. Or pour anointing oil on you. And I say you are healed. You just believe that. Because it cannot be explained. It cannot be explained. But it doesn't mean there are some people also they have the problem at every day. They say, you see it again. Even though they cannot. So, but the fact that something does not make sense doesn't mean that uh, it's not there. That is why if you look at it, it does, it's, the, it's close to the head. The next one is coherent with existing knowledge. So if it's consistent with existing knowledge, sometimes you may know because if you look at that one also, just like what I just said, somebody can look at, for example, uh, about Einstein, when he came with his law of relativity, uh, he, uh, he showed the scientific foundation to the roof. They said, wait, what? Well, all the scientists say, rubbish. <laughs> What's this? <laughs> they didn't believe him, but it was later they got to understand that he was right. Because it was a theoretical physicist because he didn't go to space when he was able to predict something that happened in space. In fact, he atomic bomb. Now it was his own his Soviet understanding of atomic uh, 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 atomic theory. Uh, the this is that they make good to develop atomic bomb. The, the he's got to have this square. It was the one that also wrote that type of equation. Trying to imagine the type of energy lock up inside the atom. So when they try it in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, 10 grams of uranium was what they used, 10 grams, only 10 grams. And it caused devastation. But what he was saying, it was not consistent, consistent with the existing knowledge. And that is why using all this point, they are not as important as the first one. They're exp experimental evidence. As you don't randomize control trial. No, if you look at it now, that was second to the last. That's why actually because many people, they believe that uh, experimental design is superior to, it's not true. Experimental design is not superior to any other design of, of research, it's not superior. It's only that um, part time, that is a method, that is a design that will be best for a particular problem. So what you should do first, it's not to be looking for research or to, or want to do experimental research, no. It's for you to, okay, this is the problem. This problem we identify. You have research uh, question. You have uh, this problem statement. What is the best way to solve it? What study, the best study design that will suit this? That's just it. Because most of the time, the study design employee depend on the stage of that problem. For example, when the first one, the first case of HIV in Nigeria was in 1986, a 60-year-old girl in Lagos, I'm sure uh, the doctor that uh, treated that child will have gone to Geneva to present that one case. Because it was real, just like what happened to COVID-19, Ebola, all those things. One case is an epidemic. So is, when you look at it, you, it's a case of Ebola or a case of COVID-19, people will be running, running, running. So, but after a while, you begin to see many people having the HIV. You begin to see that instead of talking about case reports for that one, it's a case series report. You can report about 10 cases, you see similarities in their presentation. As more and more, we know more about it. Cross-sectional study come. In that situation, you are not looking for the case. You just say you are doing screening. You see prevalence of uh, HIV. You do gather people, you test them. How many of them will have it? You need to look at the factor, do constabulation, which factor is responsible, which one is not. So cross-sectional. Until later, you now see, you begin to see effect of canceling. Experimental design begin to come in. So you see the design you use at the, that inception, when HIV just came, it's gonna be difficult for you to do experimental design, just like the COVID-19 now. So at yeah, the initial something it may be difficult to do experimental, but later, when you've already gotten a lot of hypotheses, many people are beginning to say many things uh, from their study, from what they observe, generate a lot of hypotheses. It makes you to now do analytical study. So experimental evidence. But the fact that randomized doesn't control trial don't be done does not invalidate it. So if you look at this, the analogy is the association similar to others. 
So look at this experimental design now. Let me give you an example. Last one. The, there was a time that, uh, you know, many randomized control trials was conducted, even meta-analysis, to validate the fact that uh, aspirin, aspirin, low-dose aspirin, reduced death from cardiovascular disease. So people started the prescribing low-dose aspirin. It was later, it got to know that many people died of blood, bleeding disorder, because of the aspirin, the bleeding side. The, more than what will have died from cardiovascular disease. Why? Because they just con perform control for the fact that you did randomized control trial does not make anything uh, too fantastic. After all, when you do randomized control trial, what you are looking at is more of efficacy. That is what will happen in like this setting. Because then you try to remove control for confounder from the exception. Yeah, pregnant movement should not be there. Sickle cell excluded, asthma patient excluded, all the different the comorbidity excluded. You say you want to, you want to remove the effect. By the time you finish, purely like a ID situation, of course, you give you something perfect now. After you have removed all the people that have problems, uh, you have removed them. But in real life, the person that will be using that treatment the drug you are trying to test. It doesn't have respect for anything. If it is the drug for hypertension, a diabetic person can be hypertensive, a sick clerk can be hypertensive, asthmatic patient person can be hypertensive, anybody can be hypertensive. All those who they have included, excluded during the animal control trial, they will have. And they will use the same treatment. When they use, what is the effect on them? The effect is what really happens. Why what you are able to study through your randomized control trial is efficacy. The effectiveness, mm, you have not. At the end of the day, people, if, if another study, a, 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 an observational study is not, is not going on to study how they are using it, you end up losing more people, killing more people than what have done, the number you will have saved from that drug. So I think we, that's the, I don't know if there's any question or something on this thing right just Any question? Any question? Unmute yourself, you want to talk to. If you don't unmute yourself, you cannot, we will not be able to hear you. Are people here? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Ah, maybe you know some people can be in the can be cooking. <laughs> they can be cooking and they are in the class at the same time. So when you are not asked, they are not there. So any question? Ah. Silent me <laughs> Dr. Lamingo, Dr. Gadil. So I don't have question. That is a PDF, I don't have I don't have issue with this one. Uh, okay, uh, the, uh, Ben. Ben. Ben is not there. You have to unmute yourself if you want to talk. Uh, Dr. Lamingo. Yes, sir. No question, sir. So it's very clear, right? Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Roda. Dr. Ati. Dr. Ati. Dr. Ati is not there. Oh, you, are, you have to unmute yourself. Dr. Okay. Dr. Morigby. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, sir. Was, Any uh, question? It's okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. Ah. Thank you, sir. So, maybe it's really okay. So, that's the end of uh, this thing. So, let's quickly review what we have done. Let me. Uh, pause the video so that it won't be too long since you want to